good afternoon, everyone. Before I introduce our guest speaker, Harriet Bihar, I would like to thank you, the co-op owners, for the opportunity to have served as one of your representatives on the board for the last 13 years. Supporting our co-op is essential for a number of reasons. As Erica and Troy pointed out, co-ops provide a different corporate model, one that allows for a genuinely kinder, gentler capitalism. Co-ops, as has been noted, are rooted in their communities and they are committed to a triple bottom line that includes social and environmental responsibility. Food co-ops like ours have another important role, providing real food. Real food is the foundation of good health, including a strong immune system. As Hippocrates, the father of Western medicine said, let food be thy medicine and let thy medicine be food. In our times, when so much of our food is compromised by GMOs, pesticide contamination, artificial ingredients and so forth, access to organic and sustainably grown food is essential. Food co-ops like ours also understand that farming methods are central to environmental health. Factory farming, chemical intensive farming, animal cruelty and poor working conditions should have no place in the food system. Also, there are scientists whose studies show that expanding organic and sustainable farming could do more to reverse climate change than just about any other human activity. I'm happy to say that we have an outstanding staff and general manager that are steadily building the success of the co-op day in and day out through attentive service, implementing better systems and a willingness to experiment. Finally, we have a terrific board in place that to a person brings a deep commitment and thoughtfulness to their role and contributes a wealth of relevant experience. Thank you again for the honor to have served on the board these many years. Next. Next, I have the privilege to introduce our guest speaker, Harriet Bihar. I had the pleasure of serving with Harriet on the National Organic Standards Board, the volunteer entity under the US Department of Agriculture responsible for establishing organic regulations. For almost 40 years, Harriet has been an organic educator and inspector, visiting thousands of organic operations. She formally chaired the National Organic Standards Board, where among other things, she led efforts to better guard against GMO contamination of, of organic products and also opposed extending organic certification to hydroponic operations. Since 1989, Harriet and her husband have managed a certified organic farm and commercial operation. And she was one of the earliest staff members of the crop cooperative, which we know as Organic Valley, where among other things, she researched and developed many of the new products. She has also worked with federal, state, and organic certification regulatory agencies on nutritional and organic labeling. I can say from experience that I have never met anyone involved with the organic movement who is more knowledgeable than Harriet. So it's with a great pleasure that I turn over the uh, mic or whatever to, uh, to Harriet. Welcome, Harriet. <laughs> Hi. Um, is there a way I can share my screen or I did send along a little PowerPoint, but if not, I can just talk, but I have so many pretty pictures to share. If you want, I can, um, I can put the presentation up for you. That'd be great. All right. Hold on one moment. Sure. So hello everyone. I guess one thing I could say is that I am a member uh, and pay dues yearly to three different food co-ops. There's one in my very small town that's been around for 45 years, has 100 families, it's pretty small. Uh, and then there's another one in a little bit larger town that uh, has been around for about 25 years. And then there's a third one in even a bigger city <laughs> that's been around for about 35 years. So big, big supporter of natural food co-ops. So wherever I travel, I know where I'm going to eat. Of course, there's not a lot of traveling going on. So, okay. Um, so I just, I named this the, the promise of organics and to heal ourselves and our planet. Um, as 
Dave said, I was uh, formerly on the National Organic Standards Board and uh, have been an organic farmer and educator and advocate. Uh, next slide, or can I do it? I think maybe Devorah, you have to. So um, this is my farm. Um, that's my husband, Aaron, and one of our dogs. Um, so I, even on my own certified organic farm, I've tried to uh, walk the talk I built. Um, now it's been 20 years that I've had that earth burned solar greenhouse um, where I grow vegetables um, in the winter, mostly for myself, although I do sell some out of there. I have another high tunnel that I grow spinach in for sale. Um, but it uses less than a pickup load of firewood <laughs> for a whole season and it doesn't freeze in there. So it's so I can um, mostly I sell bedding plants um, out of there so I can like overwinter rosemary and lavender and other perennials um, and not have any um, energy outlay. But then about, I think it's been about 11 years now, we put up the solar array. So our farm makes more electricity than what we use. Um, and one of my, besides bedding plants, I also grow um, medicinal and culinary herbs. And the middle picture there on the bottom is some calendula. I sell calendula blossoms to a soap maker and, um, so I have a drying room which runs continuously uh, a dehyd large dehyd uh, dehumidifier um, all summer long, which can be a lot of money in electricity and also use, but I don't worry about um, use of electricity because for me, it just comes from the sun. Uh, let's see. Oh, and then um, I am a beekeeper. I'm very, very aware of the issues with um, loss of habitat and poisoning for pollinators is such a huge issue. Um, and we are so much um, the, you know, that's, they're kind of the canary in the coal mine, all the problems we've been having with um, pollinators. Next slide. What? What? <laughs> so that's my farm, but then in the rest of my life, I've been an organic inspector for many years. Um, I've worked with um, Moses. I'm not sure how many of you know who Moses is. It's a Midwest Organic Sustainable Education Service. I worked for them for many years, and now I'm currently working with the University of Wisconsin Madison. Um, I have visited thousands of organic farms and organic processors. It's been such a privilege to get to know these people. Um, there was one farm that I went to, uh, it was an organic dairy farm. Here I am in Wisconsin. And I had been on many farms. And when you see one that is just um, a shining light of doing everything right, their animals were so healthy, all their living conditions, and this was not, a high tech farm, but it was just the care and thought that went into their their production system and, and the way they worked with their animals and their land was so wonderful. And during the inspection, I said, when I die, I want to come back as one of your cows. It kind of freaked out them a little bit, but <laughs> I mean, it just just was so much like uh, that. I want to, I want to, I would love to spend my life here as one of your animals. Um, I've also worked a lot with the government. Um, I've trained agricultural professionals. It's been very interesting to try to integrate an organic sensibility into the government bureaucracy. Uh, I know that Dan can speak to that somewhat too about being on the National Organic Standards Board because sometimes, you know, they, they don't really think holistically and it can be a challenge. Next slide. So I am an unabashed and unapologetic supporter of organic. Um, I, when I drive around, I live in an agricultural area. Um, luckily, I am near Organic Valley, so there's a lot of organic farms. We have the highest amount of organic farms in my region of any region in the country. Um, 
but there's a lot of chemical use and I always feel so sad when I see it because I know it is really not necessary. But even in organic, we continuously, we need to continuously improve. We can always learn more. Um, and especially it's frustrating, and I know Dan can speak to this too, how uh, frustrating it is because the government is so slow um, in their movement when we give them recommendations on we think things that we need to do. Also, and I have to say, especially in this administration, the political influence has really hurt um, the organic label and the organic standards because there has not been movement on things that we want and also somewhat of a push um, to kind of move us what I would consider backwards. Um, there's also, you know, big ag that wants to get involved in organic and kind of push the standards so they benefit them. Um, if you notice at the bottom, it says here that, that the organic rule was passed. The law was passed in 1990 and it took 12 years for them to write a regulation to implement it because really it was a challenge and um, they did come out with a, uh, a proposed rule which allowed GMOs and irradiation and it was very, very problematic, but we, we took care of that. Um, one other thing I wanna to say too is I recently was um, hired to be a special um, advisor on a law in a in a law case against a pipeline that was going through organic land and i was amazed by how little um the law understood what an ecosystem was <laughs> and how um even the agricultural um, advisor for the pipeline had so little understanding. And at one point, um, we, th there was a lot of written stuff back and forth and, a, you know, that just went on for quite a while. And so I don't know how many pages I wrote, probably about 30 or 50 pages of testimony. And then I had to go and stand before the judge and, um, and I was on the witness stand. And after I, they grilled me for about an hour and a half, and they, of course, did not win. They kept trying to get me to say things that I wouldn't say. Um, the, uh, the judge, before he would let me off the witness stand, said to me, I really enjoyed your discussion about pollinator habitat because there was one area of the pipeline that was going to go through kind of fallow land where the vegetable grower said that's where all of their beneficial insects you know could could grow and you know and reproduce it was to them it was not fallow it was um, a place for their ecological services from these pollinators and beneficial insects and in the pipeline's description, they just said that it was just full of dandelions. And so I gave about a two paragraph description of why dandelions are so important, especially to honeybees, but to all pollinators because they're a very early pollen source, very high protein pollen that then encourages the, um, the colonies to expand and reproduce and get ready for the honey season. And the, the, the judge said, that was so beautiful. I will never look at dandelions the same again. I, I will never kill a dandelion after reading that. So that made me feel good. And the, um, the pipeline did not end up going through the organic land. So we did win that case. Next slide. So this is one of the areas where the, um, when Dan was on the board and I was on the board, we passed a uh, improvement to the organic regulation to eliminate the incentive to convert native ecosystems to organic production. For any of you that know, um, someone has to be without the use of prohibited 
materials on land for at least three years before you can go organic. And if you see too in the upper right, that's a picture of the Amazon burning. So without this, um, we were trying to eliminate the incentive for people to take high value native ecosystems that uh, and and basically destroy them and you know grow soybeans or corn or or put cattle on them or grow sugar cane or whatever it might be we really felt that this was so important but the u.s government the usda national organic program so far has not made any effort <laughs> to implement this um, improved regulation that we voted on two years ago and and I will continue and I hope Dan too you will once you're off the board to fight for this very important um, protection for these incredibly precious native ecosystems that we need and and so as someone who grows medicinal herbs you know there's so many things in these native ecosystems that are so valuable that we don't even know what they are <laughs> um, because of that intense biodiversity. Next slide. So I, the, the next slide um, talks a little bit about um, government oversight. And I'm going to go back to 1958. I don't know how many of you know about this, but there was something called the Delaney Amendment, which was a big deal back then because there could be all kinds of stuff in processed food that, you know, nobody was really overseeing it. But this Delaney clause applied to putting stuff in processed foods and said that they could not be cancer causing. And like when, uh, I don't know how, you know, some of you are a little older, maybe remember, um, uh, saccharin and uh, you know all these different sweeteners that you know were taken off the market because they caused cancer and this was due to the Delaney clause saying that um, that the processed food could not have these poisonous materials but if you if you see it only talks about processing it does not talk about these chemicals in the growing of the food so next slide um, so we started noticing this um, in uh, 1989. Uh, there was a 60 Minutes had a big um, expose on Alar and apples and all the effects it had on children. Um, and that really um, kind of, it really gave the organic movement a big push. Um, in the, the Organic Food Production Act was already in in process at that point. And I was an, an advocate back then and, and actually spoke with senators and congressmen about the organic law. Um, we did not anticipate as many things <laughs> then as, as we wish we would have. So we're always trying to keep improving on that too. Um, but I was working at Organic Valley in 1994 when RBGH, the uh, recombinant bovine growth hormone was introduced and really um, the incredible um, push for organic milk. Uh, you know, at one point people were like, well, what's the difference between organic milk and non-organic milk? Don't cows just eat grass? And it was like, well, um, there's more to it than that. <laughs> we wish cows would just eat grass. But um, in a conventional world, that's not the uh, that's not the pristine pastoral view that you see of those poor cows in their concentration camps. Um, so um, that was really um, a very busy time for Organic Valley when I was there as the marketing coordinator and trying to get all 50 states to allow our milk uh, into the into their state. And but then in 1996, they finally did pass another law that did actually cover um, pesticides used in the production and processing of food with a very important that so so Alar 1989 finally the law that addressed the Alar problem was passed in 1996 which which um, actually included that they when they tested 
for safety, they didn't only test on adults, but they also tested uh, on babies and children um, because of their smaller stature. These things concentrate in their bodies and is so much more of a problem. Next slide. So we know we have a problem, but this is one of the things in the organic regulation that I really feel is really, really hits the nail on the head. Other things in the rule I wish would change and I try to do my part there. Um, but this is the definition of organic in our regulation, is that it is site specific with, uh, it integrates cultural, biological and mechanical practices that foster the cycling of resources, promotes ecological balance and conserves biodiversity. So um, it doesn't really talk about it doesn't use chemicals, right? It's, it's not, an, an, and it's not an input substitution. It's all about a system. It's all about mimicking nature. And I can tell you on my own farm that, I, I mean, I have some pesticides that I purchased when I was growing a lot of vegetables for Organic Valley and I thought I needed to have things on hand. I never ended up using them because we had so much beneficial insect habitat. We, we didn't grow everything in one big field. We spread it around and didn't have monocultures. Our cultural practices really um, prevented us from needing to go in and use any sort of toxic materials to grow our crops. Next slide. So uh, as an organic inspector, I have been on thousands of organic farms. And most of the time, um, you know, sometimes I'll go there and the farmer, I'll ask, why are you going organic if it's a new producer? And they'll say, well, I get a better price. And, you know, some people say, well, they shouldn't be in organic for the money. But I'm okay with that as long as they're following the rules. Because I have seen most of the time, if they're in it for just the money, but they don't actually take the standards to heart, they're not in it for more than one or two years. It's just not worth it for them because they're looking for input substitution. But the farmers, and this has happened to me so many times, I'll be there the first year and then the, I won't get assigned to that farm again maybe for four more years. And so I'll show up on the fifth year that they've been certified. And the farmer will be so excited. He'll say, I can't believe it. You're here. I want to show you everything. And he'll throw, he'll be throwing like his uh, shovel in the back of the truck. And he's like, we're going to go out. And we're going to, I'm going to show you all my earthworms. And then we're going to go in the neighbor's field and we're going to go digging in there. We won't find any. And I'm like, we're not going in the neighbor's field. We're not going to, you know, but he's so excited about seeing the changes on his farm. And, and there really has been times when, um, I, I, I don't know, I've, I've been in a field and I, I feel like it's just vibrating with life energy. There's, there's so much health and vitality in the crops. There, there's, there's just, it's, it's kind of unbelievable. And, and another um, story, my husband is also an inspector. And so we would actually go away at the same time and come home at the same time. Otherwise, we'd never see each other all summer long. And we try to run our own farm, too. Um, but at one point, he was in southern Minnesota, and I was in central Iowa. And I said, oh, you would not believe the soil I saw today on this farm. Oh, it was this beautiful silt loam. And, you know, I think it went down for like, you know, this is Iowa prairie, you know, and they're doing such a good job stewarding it. And he goes, well, I'm in Southern Minnesota and I saw the nicest dirt. And then he started talking about his soil and his ecosystems that he was seeing. And then after about five minutes, we were like, why are we arguing about this? <laughs> but we were both so excited about what we saw and, and the stewardship that we saw of the land and the environment that these farmers were on. And they realize that they cannot farm unless their ecosystem is healthy. And they do everything to do that. Um, another story too is, um, this was a new farm that I went to 
and they had used some um, mouse bait, you know, that's not allowed in organic, um, on their farm because they were having some mice or near their corn crib or something. And at the same time, they had noticed that an owl had a nest in one of their trees near the house. And they used to sit on the porch in the evenings and watch the, the, you know, the parents come and go. And they were so excited with their binoculars to see the babies. Well, then they all died. And there was this dead mouse that obviously had been killed by the, um, the, the bait. And the family was just like, we feel so bad. And that was one of the reasons why we wanted to go organic. We knew we had to do something different. We can't be killing off. I mean, the owls were not eating their corn. <laughs> and here was this unintended consequence, which again is so much a part of conventional agriculture. Yes, we need to eat, but we need to be paying attention to what we do. Next slide. So one of the things, um, again, is moving away from monoculture. You're going to see more farms like, that are like on the right-hand picture with smaller fields and areas around the edges for wildlife, birds, um, hawks, snakes, um, all of these other, you know, the, basically, um, as I would like to say to my farmers when I would visit them, is we're trying to get back to the Garden of Eden. We want to have everything in balance. You know, when you have a lot of mice and then you kill off the owls, you're going to have even more mice <laughs> because you've killed off the predator. So you want to give the predators a place to live. And so this has actually been studied. This is, these are slides from uh, Iowa State where they have found that they don't have issues with soybean aphids in small fields like this, um, whereas they do in the larger fields. Next slide. The other thing too is that a lot of organic farms um, really look at their full farm and try to figure out what are, you know, it's a whole ecosystem. It's not just like I am growing this or that, but, but they look at what can I do in my crop rotation and my cover crops? What can I do to build soil? Where can I have habitat for beneficial insects? Um, should I just allow some wild areas to grow? Do I need buffer zones between me and my conventional neighbors to prevent unwanted drift? And so a lot of farmers really sit down with their maps and try to figure out what they can do to um, improve their, all the land that they are stewarding as one whole and see that they have something, um, the eco, ecosystem services that they can build into their, that facility that they have as their farm. Next slide. So the number one thing is that organic farmers don't use any herbicides. And there's something in herbicides that's called, um, when you study this as a, um, I took the class to be a pesticide applicator, so I understand what was going on with these. Um, they call it the mode of action. And so some, and they're in different classes. So there's some types of uh, herbicides and pesticides too that have a certain mode of action like they actually cause uncontrolled cell growth so then the plant will explode and that's how it kills the plant well that sure sounds like cancer to me and we share a lot of genes with plants and with insects and with birds and with animals um, the, the vast majority of our genome is very similar. And so if we are using things on plants that cause uncontrolled cell growth, what do you think it's going to do to us? And truthfully, organic has shown that it is really not necessary. And another great sadness for me is that if we had spent all the money that we have spent on these chemical silver bullets to cure every, you know, to kill all the weeds and kill all the insects. Um, if we would have spent even, you know, one tenth of it, 
in understanding natural systems and what we could do to balance the the different um, you know beneficial insects with with uh, with problematic insects, uh, plant diseases with uh, beneficial fungi. You know, there's all kinds of things how much further along we would be. And of course, when you work within the natural system, you are not gonna have any unintended negative consequences because this is the way the earth has evolved. Next slide. So I have seen this and I think you have too, um, that organic agriculture is really good for rural communities because it takes more labor. Um, so there's more people can have jobs. There's more families. So the, the rural schools have people there, people are going to church. People can go to the stores. <laughs> when you have more people, you have more people buying food and going to the hardware store. And, and it just has, uh, it, it makes the fabric of the rural community um, much stronger because it is truly a web um, that, that has uh, a lot of uh, recirculation of that money also within that local community and I know I've been to dinner with Dan a few times and he's always trying to pay with the Berkshire bucks or whatever it is and they're like, and he has to explain to them how you know these these keep the money in our community and um, and really organic does that and I and I see that here in my area next slide um, so I've seen it a lot because of Organic Valley, and this is their new building um, built about five years ago. Um, I believe um, between the two windmills and all the solar that they have, I think it's, they're pretty close to um, producing all the electricity they need for uh, all their cheese cutting and packaging and their ghee making and then all their offices. So they've made that commitment too. Um, when I worked there, I was one of, I was the um, first marketing coordinator at Organic Valley and I actually named Organic Valley. Now it's not that, um, you know, creative of a name, <laughs> but uh, if you see here, it says crop cooperative, and that's what we used before there was an organic valley. And crop stands for, or it used to stand for, Cooley Region Organic Produce Pool. And that's the way we used to answer the phone. And I said, I can't stand this anymore. I can't answer the phone. There's only like three of us in the office. I can't answer the phone. Cooley Region Organic Pro By the time I get to the end, they, they're kind of like coolies what is this the pools they don't understand so i said we need something that'll say who we are and it falls off the tongue easy and it's not this long name now legally the cooperative is still called crop they changed it to cooperative regions of organic producer pools because they have meat pools and dairy pools and vegetable pools and egg pool um, and those are the different producers. And um, after 30 years, um, this is the first year I've not grown vegetables for Organic Valley, but I did make it to 30. Um, and, but I know that they really do, um, they have smaller producer groups and then they have um, larger groups. And so they, they really do rely a lot on their membership. And in those early days of Organic Valley, um, those meetings were, they just were wonderful for my heart. People were just so, um, so committed to wanting to get food out, organic food and offering that alternative. I mean, there was no organic milk and they wanted to give people organic milk. Um, the, so at one point we were selling under a different name. Um, it was called North Farm and they were a cooperative uh, warehouse. And then they didn't sell any cheese for like three months. And of course, we couldn't survive on that. <laughs> um, so the farmers, we were at a meeting and it was kind of a crisis. Luckily, we had some vegetables to sell to keep the doors open. And the farmers each put $100 on the table. There was eight of them. And we 
took two hundred dollars out of our meager meager you know bank stash and they said to me harriet go to california and find out what the hell is going on because this was 1990 and the premier organic market was california so harriet got on an airplane and i spent a month in california on a thousand dollars I stayed in youth hostels. I, I, you know, I had people that I knew. I slept on their, I had my sleeping bag. I slept on the floor of their, you know, living rooms. I did whatever I needed to do. And I went from San Diego to Arcadia. I visited over 50 retail stores and 15 distributors. And I came back on February 1 and I said, We've got orders. We better get a label and a brand name <laughs> because we got people who want cheese. Uh, and I found out that the, the other distributor that had our product was selling it to distributors in California that didn't have refrigeration on their trucks. And so our cheese was arriving like slimy. <laughs> I, I mean, I know, you know, I mean, it's California, you can't, I mean, I suppose if it's winter in Wisconsin, you could have no refrigeration on your truck, but you can't do it in California. So by Earth Day, we were shipping our first organic cheese under Organic Valley. Um, so that was kind of, but a lot of it was that support by the farmers. They said, we know we can do this. We know we have a good product. We know that people need, need this from us. Next slide. So it's not only Wisconsin that has benefited from organic production and organic processors and organic and co-ops that sell organic food that people want. Um, this is a map of certified, it's only from 2015, that's because the government doesn't, doesn't move so slow, but um, you can see that you know, your area has got a lot of um, organic farms and processors and livestock and crops. Um, and so, but that we do have to keep working on some other areas, uh, especially in the South, that don't have um, good infrastructure. So, you know, Organic Valley offered a lot to the producers here to um, be able to have a place to take their raw milk and make it into cheese and butter and yogurt and all that other good stuff. Next slide. No, that went backwards. No, oh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at mine. <laughs> Okay, so organic um, follows something called the precautionary principle, which they follow in the European Union in their government, but we don't follow that here in our government. We, we put food out there, and then if someone gets sick, then we, we take it back. <laughs> but in Europe, you have to prove that it's safe before you're allowed to sell it. That's not the way we have it here. Um, and we find that a lot of the, um, the genetically modified foods are having unintended consequences. So the, BT, the bacterius thuringiensis toxin that's in a lot of the corn, which kills corn um, earworm and rootworm, um, it's in every piece of DNA of that corn. So if a corn stalk flows into a creek, it then kills the larva of insects that trout eat. And we are actually finding that trout, especially in Iowa, have declined by like 60% because they don't have any insects to eat because they've been killed by pieces of genetically modified corn stalks. Very sad. Um, and of course, like I said, it's in every piece of DNA. So if you eat um, genetically modified corn, you're getting bacteria thuringiensis. <laughs> you're getting a pesticide. Uh, yeah, pretty bad. Next slide. Um, the other thing, uh, there's something called neonicotinoids. I don't know if you've heard of these. These are um, seed treatments put on seeds. But what is so um, insidious about this is it's a, it goes on the outside of the seed. 
but it actually infiltrates the seed and moves up into the, the plant. So uh, it's in the pollen and the nectar and the, you know, the juices of the plant. So if any, if a bird <laughs> or, a, or a monarch butterfly or whatever consumes pollen or nectar from any of these plants, they are getting this neonicotinoid. So it would kill you and I, and it, it kills them. So it kills birds. I don't know any of you are bird lovers, but you probably have heard that we've lost 60% of our birds since 1970. And I know I can definitely see that in my bird feeder. I don't know if any of you are driving around in your cars all summer long and can remember when you used to have to clean off the dead insects off your windshields. We don't have to do that anymore. We don't have all those insects. Well, that's partially why the birds are disappearing. So we have to be always thinking about, you know, yeah, farmers want to grow food and we need to eat food and we have, don't want to worry about having, um, uh, you know, insects in our food or whatever. But if we kill off all the insects, we're going to have unintended consequences because we're going to kill off all of our birds too. Next slide. Um, it's a misnomer that we're using less pesticides than we used to. Um, at one point, um, I, I am a, I'm the chair of the Wisconsin Organic Advisory Council, which is under the uh, Department of Agriculture. And somebody from Monsanto called us and said, we, we would like to come and talk to you. We said, okay, we hadn't expected Monsanto to come and talk to us as the Organic Advisory Council, but so he came and we had first talked ahead of time and said, well, we're gonna not be too confrontational with him and, you know, nicey, nicey. But then he, the first thing he said when he walked in the door was, look, I don't want you to be nice to me. I want the gloves off. I wanna have a real conversation. And, and so we started kind of laying into him. <laughs> about the problem with GMOs and that what's been happening is they have to keep um, stacking the resistance to herbicides because they're causing all these weeds to become resistant. And so it's like this treadmill that they can't get off. And so he came, he wanted to learn from us, is there another way to do this? Because we see this is not sustainable, but this is my job. So this is all, I, this is what I went to school was how to be a biotech engineer and modif genetically modify seeds. And, but I can see that this is a treadmill. And so at this point, they are using 2,4-D, which is, um, was in Agent Orange. We know what that does. Um, and dicamba, um, because the, the glyphosate is no longer effective. And at some point, they're just going to run out of herbicides, and you're going to have all these farmers who don't know how to grow food any other way. So we have to keep getting people to transition to organic. Next slide. So it's not all gloom and doom. Um, we can, you know, improve soil. Um, this is from Rodale. I know you all probably know who Rodale is. And actually on the previous slide, there was a picture. Um, could we go back to the previous slide I wanted to mention? Um, there's something called a roller crimper. So in organic, we have a no-till system where we can plant rye the, winter, the, the fall before, and then in the spring, we roll it down and that's that picture on the bottom we flatten it and then we go through that rolled mulch with an aggressive planter and we plant soybeans and so that's organic no-till and we didn't use any herbicides and then at the end we have all this organic matter that we can incorporate into the soil and improve soil structure like the next picture shows so organic is not afraid of technology. We know how, we are trying to learn how to mimic nature and use nature's tools to produce our food. Next slide. 
So I know a lot of your customers, especially new people coming into the co-op, they kind of want to know why does organic food cost more? Well, part of it is we're such a small part of the organ of the, the food system. So it costs us more money to truck things here and there. You know, we have smaller lots. We don't have giant warehouses. Um, you know, there's a lot of, you know, and, and of course, supporting the local economy. Um, so, so as we get into that economy of scale, um, some of that will come down. But of course, to conventional, I don't know if you've heard the news, they're, they're saying that this year, farmers will earn 30 to 40 percent of their income from government payments. <laughs> um, so uh, that's not all going into organic farmers' hands. Um, but there's been an, un, an unequal um, monetary reward for conventional agriculture over um, non-organic. And I uh, I uh, go into my local farm service agency office and they all moan when I walk in the door because I have way too much diversity. They're just saying, well, I just, I just want to help, you know, you know, you grow corn, you grow soybeans, you grow hay. It's like, no, I grow 60 different kinds of vegetables. And of course they have to write all that down and uh, you know, the system is not set up for diversity. And then, of course, I grow a lot of cover crops and I grow things for my honeybees um, to, for flowering and for nectar for them. And so they'll say, why do you have all this clover? And I, well, it's bee forage. And they're like, well, we don't have a category for bee forage <laughs> in, our, in our computer. And I'm like, okay, well, that's what it is. You know, I don't have cows. I have bees but they are livestock and I've got hundreds of thousands of them. Next slide. Uh, so I just was reading this morning an article that um, food, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember which group, Friends of the Earth did a study and found that if people stopped eating, if people went on an organic food diet, they had 70% less glyphosate in their urine after a week. So that's pretty intense statistic. So we don't really want this stuff in our food. We don't want it in our bodies. And really, we don't want it in our ecosystems because it is causing incredible damage. Um, from, you know, losing our birds and our insects to climate change. Um, organic can, can really and does increase carbon in the soil. It improves biodiversity because the farmers know they depend on that for their agricultural production. And really, um, like I said, I want to come back as that woman's cow in my next life because it's just, it is so imbalanced with nature. Um, there's just an incredible beauty to it. Next slide. So there are various names, um, natural, sustainable. Now the new word is regenerative. And there's organic and then there's real organic. Um, truthfully, only organic has a certification behind it. Um, natural doesn't really mean anything in the marketplace. The people who sell things as natural would like to make it seem like it means something, but it doesn't. Um, technically, under the USDA, uh, if you want to call something a natural meat, as long as it hasn't been marinated after it, after it was you know, cut up and made into meat, then it's natural. It has nothing to do whether the animal had hormones or, you know, what kind of food it was given or whatever. So it has no meaning. Uh, the meaning sustainable has also been co-opted by the conventional world. If you would go on the formerly Monsanto website, it's all, all about being sustainable um, with their genetically modified seeds and, and their um, chemical herbicides. Regenerative is a wonderful word. The problem is um, it is starting to get um, co-opted as well. 
Um, so there is a regenerative organic certification system uh, just announced by Rodale just a couple of months ago. Um, but I'm just really afraid that the word regenerative will go the way of sustainable and natural because there is no legal definition to, um, to have it. So when, when I say it, it, it means it will mean the same thing as the guy from, you know, Dow Chemical. He's got a totally different definition than I do. And so it's a very confusing. Um, so I'm just saying, if you're going to get behind regenerative, be really clear about who's saying it and what they mean. And then and educate um, the people that you are talking to about regenerative, what you mean by your type of regenerative. Next slide. So I know there's a lot of confusion about why some of us did not like hydroponic to be labeled as organic. So I thought I would just um, let you know, like, does that purple, does that look like organic food to you? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's basically, uh, I, I call them CAFOs for plants. You know, they're just, you know, concentrated plant growing houses where they just give them the plant, you know, this will make the plant grow faster. Um, it's not about the ecosystem. As a matter of fact, there's a high amount of energy use in these facilities. Um, they are not any safer. There's been all kinds of um, food um, uh, safety outbreaks from hydroponic farms, as well as um, soil farms. Um, so that's, take that off the table. Um, and, and so what I, I just don't see where they're providing a habitat for beneficial insects here, or, you know, how are they going to, you know, allow an endangered snake to have a hypericum, you know, a, a you know, place to live, or, I, I'm not saying that it's a bad system, but it does not meet that definition of organic, which includes cycling of resources, conserving biodiversity, and promoting ecological balance. Of course, there is no ecology in these buildings. And instead, a heavy use of non-renewable resources. Next slide. And so in our organic law and rule, it talks all about soil as the foundation and building soil. And this is truly our um, best agricultural resource is soil. And of course, when we incorporate um, cover crops into soil, we are burying carbon there. That doesn't happen on a hydroponic farm. <laughs> There's no carbon uh, recycling. <laughs> Next slide. So I'm, I'm going to say that organic can feed the world. I have been on many farms where they are one of the highest producing farms in the county for their their type um, vegetables fruits corn soybeans high producing you know uh, dairy farmers um, as far as when you compare it to the especially to the use and use using up of a resource to then the production of the food um, Organic beats out conventional every day because we're constantly every year improving our resources for the next year instead of using them up or damaging them. And it's all about the system. Uh, there was one elderly man in Iowa that said to me once, I said, well, do you have a hired hand? And he said, no, I work for nature. And this was just this kind of old farmer. And he was another one of these guys that wanted me to go into the neighbor's field and look at how bad it was. And I'm like, no, I'm not going in the neighbor's conventional field. Next slide. I'm all for local food, but I think if we can try to encourage our local growers to have, uh, to grow organically, then we will benefit from clean rivers and streams and clean air 
and more carbon <laughs> in our soils in our local area. So um, I know that there is some trucking, you know, comes from California or whatever, but I really do think we need to look at the greater ecosystem and what we are supporting. Next slide. Um, organic foods, um, there has not been a lot of studies. I mean, who's gonna pay for them to see if organic food is really healthier? But there, we have shown that it is higher in antioxidants. And one of the reasons is the American uh, Chemical Society uh, actually did a study and, found, and, and their premise was that because organic crops have to fight weeds a little bit, maybe have a little bit of insects nibbling on them, that those plants then build a more robust immune system and, that's, and that increases the antioxidants in those plants and then those become more antioxidants in the food that then we eat. And that's from the American Chemical Society. Um, grazing animals, which are required, especially for ruminants, um, have higher omega-3s and CLAs. And maybe you know about that. Um, and organic farmers, in order to um, have less weeds, they also know that they need to balance their soils, nutrients, because certain weeds like to grow when the nutrients are imbalanced in their soils. So when they have more balanced nutrition in their soils, that turns into more nutrition in their crops. Next slide. Um, a lot of people know that there's, you know, organic farmers can't use pesticides, but there are some pesticides allowed. But again, they can't use those unless, so there are some synthetic pesticides allowed in organic but they can't be used unless the farmer, and I as an inspector always ask this question and go through it with them, what cultural, mechanical, and biological practices did they use before they went to the synthetic? So organic is not an input, input substitution. It's, in, it's changing inputs for systems. And if you have a problem, if all your systems have failed, then you can go to this least toxic synthetic that we have approved. And the, the, uh, the pesticide is reviewed not just for uh, human health, but it looks at um, environmental health, it looks at how it's produced, is there any environmental damage in its manufacture or its disposal? So there's a, a very intense, and I know that Dan can talk about that probably for hours, of the review of the materials before they are allowed in organic. Next slide. Um, one thing, and I don't know, I think Massachusetts at one point had a GMO labeling law um, or was considering one with Vermont. This is something very sad. And maybe if we get a new administration, we could try to work on this again. Really, consumers should know if they are eating GMO food or not. Uh, it's really unfair that it's kind of buried in our food supply because of the uh, health impacts. Um, and, uh, you know, our government has been ignoring that. So really, um, organic at this point is the only place you can go and know that those synthetic pesticides are not there. Next slide. So in organic, no genetic engineering, no sewage sludge, believe it or not, people use sewage sludge <laughs> and it's got drugs and heavy metals and all of that and that's allowed in conventional agriculture and no irradiation on the food um, after it's been harvested and of course no synthetics that have not been approved. Next slide. So it's not only in the field that we talk about this but it's through um, the whole processing, and I do a lot of processing inspections. Um, you would not believe some of the insecticides that are used in food facilities. I mean, none of that is allowed in organic. And a lot of people who then uh, become organic processors, again, I go back three or four years later and they say, wow, we have saved so much money 
by not spraying all those pesticides we didn't even need them we just had to like put a screen over here and and you know do some you know positive air to keep the insects from flying in or change for a light fixture move it away from right over the door so the, the insects aren't um, coming right in when we open that door at night um, all of a sudden they didn't they found they didn't even need the pesticides anymore next slide and that's uh, oh, almost my last one. So what do we have? The future for organic, I hope is bright. Um, there is always pressure to lessen the integrity of the standards and the oversight, especially as larger corporations move into organic and find some of the rules to be burdensome. Um, not to say that big is always bad, it's not. Um, I've been to some very large facilities that are doing a magnificent job um, and they have the money to do it. <laughs> they need to do the right thing. But a lot of times um, if it's just um, kind of a sideline and it's just kind of a pain in the neck and they just don't want to deal with it, um, you know, there, there's just this, always this kind of push and I think Dan would agree with me. Um, to kind of lessen um, the integrity of those standards, whereas um, many of us want to see them continually improved and not lessened. Um, we have had issues with fraud, the fact that organic brings the higher price in the marketplace. We have had people, you know, $200 million uh, out in Nebraska, someone was selling non-organic corn as organic. Um, we've had fraud coming in from Turkey with, uh, you know, the Russian mafia being involved and these are very sophisticated players and they're doing a lot of work to forge certificates and lots of um, so lots of things going on um, that prevent um, us from having always what we're paying for, which is a real shame. Um, the smaller farms and processors always face intense competition when a larger corporation comes in. Um, as I said before, government oversight can be tainted by political pressure. We've found that where the um, Undersecretary of Ag said that organic maybe would consider GMOs. We, we certainly gave him a loud shout out on that one. Um, all the different labels in the marketplace. And climate change is really a challenge, very much so for organic farmers, because we rely so much on healthy ecosystems. And so when our ecosystems are out of balance, we really have a tough time. Next slide. So in June 2009, um, uh, someone, I, I think he's from Indiana, looked at all the consolidation in the organic uh, food world and go to the next slide. And this is my last slide now. So if this is 2009 and this is 2020. So we have gotten a lot more consolidated. Well, the big companies have, I know you probably can't read it very much, but you get the idea of all the little satellite companies. Those all used to be individual companies that now are being gobbled up by larger food corporations. Um, and I know that you probably even suffer somewhat as a co-op, trying to find good pricing um, and all of that when you're competing with larger companies, Costco and Trader Joe's, you know, that, that can kind of do volume buying and undercut, even pay less. I mean, some of the, um, Places like United Naturals, which I'm sure you use to, to get some of your food, um, they have bulk prices. And if you don't, and so basically the people who buy a lot pay very little, they almost get it for wholesale. <laughs> and the smaller volumes are subsidizing the big buyers. And that's just the way it is. And it's really a shame. And it, wasn't the way it used to be. It used to be that all the natural food co-ops were served by cooperative warehouses and United Naturals came in and either bought them out or ran them out of business. And I was there at the Blooming Prairie Co-op annual meeting and heard Michael Funk, I don't even know if he's still the CEO, stand up in front of their annual meeting and there was about 300 people there 
and said, either you take a dollar ten on the dollar of your equity from me, or I'll run you out of business. That's a quote. So they took the dollar ten, and Blooming Prairie was out of business. And they sold, they, they served Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Iowa. And that happened to all the, you know, you had Northeast co-ops, um, Stowe Mills, I mean, all these old, they don't exist anymore. Who are your choices? You've got United Naturals and maybe some local other choices, but you don't have many choices. And this is why. So I don't know where we fight that, <laughs> but um, I guess that's the end. <laughs> Uh, not not as not as positive as I want it to be, except that um, if we keep a strong local economy and and help our local people, um, you know, keep in business, that maybe we can make a difference and and use those Berkshire bucks. <laughs>